This is a set of lectures about cells and their environment. I'm going to talk about internal cell structures and cell structures outside the cells and how they are involved in organizing, forming cells into tissues and organ function. This series of lectures is going to roughly follow um, these uh, particular um, bullet points. We're going to talk about the cytoskeleton, then cell to cell interactions, the extracellular matrix, cell to the extracellular matrix in interactions, and cell movement. There's also, um, this is probably best covered in further reading, and we recommend molecular biology of the cell. Um, for a simpler approach, Campbell's biology, and also the human physiology textbook, Pocock and Richard, contains some brief description of the cytoskeleton. Okay, so why have this lecture? Well, I think you really have to try and understand the sheer magnitude of the number of cells within the human body. So there's over 10 trillion cells. That's the ten, one times 10 to the power of 13 cells. It's an astronomically high number. So how do we get all those cells to first of all, form a structure you know, to form a human body? And how do we get them to communicate with each other? Well, the first step in that is that cells need to be connected and they need to work together in a coordinated fashion in order for tissues and functions, uh, organs to function properly. And I think a key thing that I'll try and get across through these lectures is that the phenotype, how a cell is and how a cell looks, is changed by their environment. So you'll have learned about stem cells, but it's also important to remember that as well as stem cells, cells that have already differentiated will be affected by their environment and it will change the way those cells function. As well as being able to allow all these cells to talk to each other, you know, vast number of cells, you've got to realise that we also need the infrastructure within our bodies that holds us together and our bodies have got to be able to cope with stress, you know, just walking around um, running, jumping, if you like, our ancestors running away from tigers. We've also got to allow for changing environments, moving from hot to cold, etc. So, oh, and, and also we get injured during this process, so we need to be able to repair ourselves. So, essentially, what this lecture is about is, you know, how cells communicate with each other and we focus a lot on hormonal signaling but here you know we're talking about how cells communicate with each other ensuring that each cell plays its proper part and is coordinated with its neighbors so one of the things i'm going to cover is is some of the basics into how cells organize into tissues and organs and I think we're all familiar with tissues and organs, and it's no surprise to find out that cells with similar functions connect together to form tissues. That's not quite the same as an organ because an organ is often made up of several tissues. And a good example of this is if we look at this cartoon of the skin, which is one of the largest organs in your body, but the skin contains several tissues. It has the epidermis, the dermis here and also underlying fatty tissue and you can see there's different type of cells through to the skin cells the melanocytes we have sweat glands we have hair follicles in there and of course we have the blood supply supplying the energy and nutrients to the tissue and this second diagram just shows um, an actual a micrograph uh, taken for a section of skin so where you can see those divisions of the tissues within the skin and you can hopefully see the clear epidermis and dermal layer which contains clearly different types of cells.
In fact, as I'm sure you're aware, there are a myriad of different types of tissues, many of which we're going to cover, uh, tissues and organs, many of which we cover in, in this um, lecture series, you know, ranging from your, your fat cells, adipose tissues, the bone, the skin, and so on. I'm going to do focus quite a lot on some of these, like the skeletal muscle. And, and I don't think you need to be an expert to look at all these different uh, micrographs to see that although they're all full of cells, there's some very, very different structures in the body performing very, very different functions, of course. So, of course, these structures are adapted to their environment. They're also adapted to maximize the performance of their function. So, for example, you can see the rigid shape and lines in the skeletal muscle, which give help provide force of contraction. In the intestine, we can see villi here. I think it provides an enormous surface area in which we can withdraw nutrients from, from the, our, our food that we ingest. So all kinds of different uh, organizing into tissues and uh, organs. And that all requires coordination. So in order to coordinate, then cells have got to be able to connect. So first of all, though, if we're going to understand how cells connect to one another, we actually have to first look inside the cells and understand the cytoskeleton. And this is just a really nice uh, picture here in the uh, in, in the red. And I apologize if you're colorblind, I'll use magenta. You can see around here. We can see actin filaments. In the green, we have the microtubule network radiating in a different direction. And in the blue, we have the nucleus. But hopefully you can see there that there's a very clear internal structure to the cells. We often think of cells of, of, of blobs, maybe containing organelles, but it's worth realizing that they have a skeleton and we call that the cytoskeleton. The cytoskeleton is made up of really three different major types of, of fibers. The first one I'm going to talk about are the actin filaments. And if you like, it's the actin filaments that determine the shape of the cell. They provide strength or stiffness to the cell structure. And they're also highly involved in the movement of, of, of cells and also involved in the contractile processes of cells. So what are the actual, and we'll come into the actual roles of actin in these processes more in a little bit. Here I'm gonna focus on the actual filaments themselves. So these are very small individual filaments for about five to nine nanometers, five to nine millionths of a meter in diameter. And each fiber, what we have is uh, uh, these very thin fibers can form bundles and wrap around each other. And that just like wrapping a rope together or a piece of string has many filaments within it. And all twisted together, it gives it stronger and stronger. So string could be turned into rope, for example. It's formed from protein molecules which join together. So the protein is actin and it's what we call monomers. So little individual pieces of actin grow together and they grow with the use of ATP for energy. And they add at the what we call the plus end of the molecule. So they only grow at one end of the filament. They fall apart at the minus um, end of the filament. And we'll talk about this growing and shrinking of actin filaments a little bit later. Now, actin is a very 
common protein. It's found in most cells and it tends to make up about about 1% to 5% of a typical uh, cell. And of course, in muscle, um, where we have lots of actin fibers, it can actually make up about 20% of the cell in terms of weight. So they're one of the major skeletal structures. The next structure or the next fiber is what we call microtubules. Now microtubules help to organize the, the, um, the structure within the cell. And you can imagine them as being like the roadways within the cell. Uh, um, they're like the transport system. Uh, and, but they're also a cell that help shape the cell and can be involved in cell movement as well. So just they're not just the transport system, but um, th they do provide different roles. Now, microtubules are much, much larger than actin. And again, they're made up of, um, uh, uh, um, so if you remember about five to 10 uh, uh, um, nanometers, these are about 25 nanometers across in this direction. Okay, um, and they're actually hollow cylinders as well. So they have a bit more structural integrity. And the other key feature that sets them apart from the microtubules, actin and filaments are found all over the cell. Well, they all arise from the same region of the cell, which I'm just drawing in now, which is located near the nucleus which is the microtubule organizing center. I'll just draw the line across. And what happens is that tubulin protein monomers, again, all join at the, and I'll just write this, the plus end of the monomer. So the this end is joined to that um, organizing center. This end is where the monomers join and they, they join together with GTP rather than ATP, okay? And that's what forms those monomers and builds up this cylinder tube. The final major component of of the uh, cytoskeleton are what we call intermediate filaments. And the intermediate filaments are harder to discuss because the, the, the nature, the proteins that make up the filaments are much more diverse than microtubules or actin filaments. In fact, there's over 50 proteins, including some that you've probably heard of, like keratin, which as you hopefully know, um, make up your nails and your hair, lamins, uh, vimentins, neurofilaments, and probably the other one you've heard of is myosin because that helps make up muscle fibers as well. And they vary quite a lot by cell type. Okay. Again, these filaments help provide uh, mechanical strength. And hopefully you can see in, in the pictures, you can see um, certainly in this picture where we can see that the network of, of intermediate filaments, you can see how that could provide uh, strength to, to the tissue, but it's not organized from a single organizing center like tubulin. They're a bit more like actin, they can, they can form anywhere. But unlike actin, um, th th these tend to form rope-like fibers, which again are quite small, a little bit bigger in actin filaments, about 8 to 12 nanometers in diameter. Now the thing that's very different about these is that they're called apolar, so there's no plus or minus end. What we have is the monomers, or two monomers come together, shown in two different colors here, to form a dimer. So we have the N terminus and the C terminus. Okay, and 
two dimers come together so that the n terminus binds to the c terminus of a neighboring filament at one end and also binds n to c at the other end and then what happens is these tetramers then form protofilaments and then you begin to get intermediate filaments when chains of these protofilaments all come together so you can also imagine like these like being like steel girders or ropes with the filaments wrapped around each other i'm just going to stop you for the next part